Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. And just before I start, um, I was working on this essay back home in Puerto Rico when I received the tragic news of the passing of Angel Sainz Valdillos, a dear friend and a friend of many here, who was not only a towering scholar of impressive erudition but a generous mentor, a man of singular kindness, so I just want to present this in his memory. A 15th century writer of philosophy for a Christian prince, written in the form of an allegorical fable. The intellect personified is sorted by reason and truth into the palace of wisdom. The intellect is introduced there into the memorable occasion of ancient and medieval philosophical luminaries. World number one in your general. Llegándose más a ser, ha habido una gran compañía de hombres muy honrados y muy sabios, todos con las caras inflamadas que parecían un par de estrellas. And then further down, he visto allí el ladón, hizo el pleno, a otros contemporáneos suyos. En los modernos, among the moderns, vivo allí el alfarabio, algacel, avicena, el muisén de Egipto, y otros de gran veneración que eran en su compañía. Trangman's mutual appearance in this gallery, its only Jewish member, is not simply ornamental. It does not represent a purely impressionistic effort to summon his name as a disembodied cipher of philosophical learning. The Latorre's encyclopedic fable is rather skipped in my Moravian doctrine. It reconnoitres an unusual range of Greek, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim philosophical sources to expound his religious Weltanschauung for the benefit of a Hispano-Christian student, but all framed by a substantive overview of Maimonidian thought. Maimonidian's guide is the primary source of the Latorre's philosophical curriculum. The most basic stable problems in medieval Aristotelianism, especially in the fields of metaphysics and natural philosophy, are given by the Latorre and Maimonidian solutions excerpted from the guide sometimes verbatim, always in elegant didactic prose of enviable precision and even literary finesse. The Latorre's venerable classic of all Spanish prose raises an intriguing question for Iberian intellectual history. How did Maimonides become the main philosophical authority for the primary education of the Christian aristocrat in 15th century Spain? What is the historical context that allowed Maimonides' guide, the Jewish philosophical classic for excellence, to become a central reference in the intellectual life of Christian Spain in the late Middle Ages? Now, part of the context for a plausible answer is found in the main pretext for my participation in here today, my participation in this and in essence translation of Rantan's philosophical capo laboro. The oldest vernacular translation of the guide into an European language, aside from Latin, was the old Spanish mostrador e enseñador de los turbados by Pedro de Toledo, another 15th century work that probably predates de la Torre's vision by at least a few years and which made the guide readily available to an elite circle of Hispano Christian readers. Toledo's Mostrador was not the Latorre's immediate source on Maimonides, but both works represent a broader phenomenon in Iberian intellectual history that made Maimonidian philosophy substantive fodder for Hispano Christian thought. The active recourse of Christian aristocrats to Jewish and conversion Hebrides for the translation and study of Hebrew works in their Ibero Romance vernacular. To appreciate Toledo's translation of the guide, it must be placed within its peculiar historical context on the Iberian side of the Pyramids. My goal for today is twofold. First, a brief reflection 
on the social and historical context for Christian patronage of the Spanish translation from Hebrew in 15th century Castile. Second, a selective overview of what we know about Toledo's Spanish guide against his historical backdrop with particular attention to his translation choices and all the pedagogical accommodations for the benefit of his Christian sponsor. Let us start with the historical context. Pedro de Toledo's Castilian Mostrador belongs to a variegated corpus of Hebrew works translated into Spanish mostly in the 15th century. These translations cover a decent range of Jewish intellectual domains. They include all Spanish romanciamientos of the Hebrew Bible, Rabbinic exegetical sources, Jewish philosophic classics, synoptic digests of medieval Jewish law, ethical treatises, historical chronicles, and scientific literature, mainly astronomy and astronomy. Number two, the Hanau is a partial list of some of those translations and the manuscripts in which they are preserved. Some of these texts, such as the abridged Old Spanish translation of Haveri Sefer Hatusari, were probably produced either for internal Jewish use or else for conversion readers, including a handful in Hebrew and Hamia in Hebrew script, and not a few, while commissioned by Christians, were built upon an earlier tradition of intra Jewish translation. The case with many of the Old Spanish Bibles that are still extant, there are more medieval translations of the Bible into Spanish and into any other European vernacular. The majority of these pronunciamientos were made, nonetheless, like Toledo's Mostrador, at the behest of Christian patrons, coming down to us in late medieval codices, written in Latin script and with the Hispano Christian readership in mind. The Christian patrons are, by and large, prominent Castilian aristocrats steep in contemporary politics, caught up in the complex courtly alliances and internist in struggles between nobles and kings in the Iberian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, and Navarra. These noblemen were not, unlike intellectuals among the clergy, they were not professional scholars with the command of Latin, but rather learned amateurs with broader personal interests, or at least a proto-humanist appreciation for the value of culture, and whose vernacular literacy had whetted their appetite for more accessible books both in both secular and religious subjects. These lay mecenas commissioned translations from Latin and the other European vernaculars, built up impressive libraries and brought a wide array of literati to their course in order to foster their cultural interests. The latter included both Jewish and conversion scholars who provided a rare access to Hebrew sources and a cherished expertise in certain domains of intellectual life that they also valued, mainly biblical scholarship, astronomy, and philosophy. This rabbinic scholar had a complex relationship with their Hispano-Christian sponsors, rooted in delicate negotiations within social and institutional context of political subservience and the cumulative pressure of Christian apologetic and conversionary efforts, but even had a precarious time for Iberian Jews in the momentous aftermath of the 1391 massacres and mass conversions the Tortosa disputations of 1413-1414, and other comparable ordeals for the peninsula of the Hamas, Jewish and conversion scholars were sought after and given protection by these Christian patrons at the learned humanist course. These scholarly endeavors allowed the Jewish intellectual heritage to play something of a formative role in the cultural life of late medieval Christian Spain. Alfonso de la Torre's primer of Maimonidian philosophy, for example, not exactly a translation, but an encyclopedic center of translated sources, <laughs> had been commissioned for the primary education of Carlos de Diana, Crown Prince of Navarra. The powerful masters of the three religious military orders in 15th century Spain, Calatrava, Santiago, and Alcantara, also oversaw Renaissance style towards Avangaleth, with Rabbinic scholars at their service, associated with major translation projects and other cultural initiatives of comparable heft. During the 
las leyes of the 15th century, the Jewish holiness of Abraham Sakuto, also of the astronomical chaos in the Hibur Hagadol, served at the court of Juan de Sundi de Pimentel, master of the order of Alcantara from 1475 to 1494. Half a century earlier, Don Luis de Guzman, master of the order of Calatrava and a highly influential Castilian politician in the circle of John II of Castile, expressed the commission Rabbi Moshe Arrayel of Guadalajara with a Spanish translation and commentary of the entire Bible, prepared in 1422 and 1430 under his active patronage, the Arrayel Bible. This monumental illustrated college, which I have been editing with the other colleagues, including the late Sainz Vadilus, remains one of the most impressive works of Hispanic Jewish scholarship in all Spanish, a stunning translation with over 6,300 exegetical glosses that reconnoitre at least the Usman's explicit command, both the rabbinic mitrashim and the medieval biblical commentaries, Andalusian and Franco-Jewish, along with Christian Avenida by two Mendicant friars, and something significant for our Congress, selective rationalist interpretations of biblical passages and rabbinic agathol in an allegorical key drawn from Maimonides' sky. Aragel was a steadfast Maimonidian, and, like Pedro de Toledo, he was more than happy to educate his Christian patron on Maimonides' distinctive contributions to Jewish biblical interpretation. Like Moshe Aragel in Luis de Guzman's court, Pedro de Toledo also became, also became as the Hebrides, the beneficiary of a Christian patron at the learned court of an Iberian military order. Toledo's translation of the guide was first commissioned by Gomez Suarez de Figueroa, who died in 1429, first Lord of Feria, Safra, and Navarra in the province of Badajoz, and you have the text Hangout 3A. Gomez was the firstborn and hence heir to Lorenzo Suarez de Figueroa, a prominent earth supporter of the Castellan dynasty and master of Santiago of the Order of Santiago from 1383 to 1409. Pedro de Toledo, clear that this behest, finished translating the second part of the guide in 1419 at one of his little domains. Moreover, while Gomez himself died in 1429, three years before the date recorded in the colophon of Toledo's translation of the third part, it seems more than probable that Toledo's mostrador passed into the hands of yet another Hispano-Christian nobleman, a patron of Jewish scholars, and a major poet in his own right who probably supported its completion, Domingo Lopez de Mendoza, Marques de Santillana. Santillana is not only revered among his studies as one of the three, four greatest Spanish poets of the 15th century, but he was also an active patron of culture who amassed one of the most impressive of the humanist libraries in Castile at the palace of the Infantil in Guadalajara. His library was engrossed with significant translations of classical and Renaissance Latin and Italian works, and what interests here, gives on Hebrew words, including Toledo's Mostrador and an old Spanish translation of the Hebrew Bible. Santillana's active interest in Hispanic Jewish culture is well established. His poetry showcases selective borrowings from the old Spanish Bible and probably even Maimonides' guide via Toledo's translation. In his famous Provenio de Carta on the Sabre de Portugal, he professes as well literary admiration for the old Spanish novel poem Proverbios Morales by Rabbi Shemina Gutierrez and Shem Tof de Carrion. Santillana was twice brother in law of Gomez Suarez de Figueroa. Santillana married his sister Catalina, Gomez married Santillana's sister Elvira, very sexual. Their close ties may explain how the only Extant manuscript of Toledo's translation of the guide, found in the library of Osuna Infantado at the time of his sale to the Biblioteca Nacional de Madrid in 1884, may have belonged to Santillana's original collection in Guadalajara. This is grosso modo the Hispano Christian context in which Pedro de Toledo's translation was conceived and executed. Let us now review what else we know about the Mostrador itself. 
several colleagues in Spanish guy, survives in a single manuscript, now kept at the Biblioteca Nacional de Madrid, number 10289. The codex is comprised of 141 folios with Toledo's translation into columns. The first 20 folios are also crammed with more than 1,500 glosses, both marginal and interlinear, by an anonymous, delightfully cantankerous Jewish reader who sharply and relentlessly criticizes the putative shortcomings of Toledo's translation both linguistic and with respect to Toledo's rabbinic, exegetical, and philosophical learning, providing alternative translations of selected terms and even entire passages, passion and demon, is a curmudgeon after my heart. A little more than 180 glosses by the translator himself are scattered as well throughout the entire manuscript, both as an apologia pro opere suo and for the pedagogical benefit of his Christian patron, confirming, as we will see, Toledo's extraordinary claims on his approach to translation. Very little is known about Pedro de Toledo's life. In his prologue to the Mostrador, Pedro introduces himself as the son of Juan del Castillo. Some scholars identify the latter with Juan and Diego de Toledo, a Jewish convert to Christianity who wrote an anti-Jewish tractate in 1416 entitled Tractatus contra Judeos, a treatise written in the aftermath of the dissertations and also translated into Spanish. But this is purely conjectural. Neither can we ascertain for sure whether Pedro himself was a Jew or a converso. Now, one could plausibly argue from his command of philosophical Hebrew and the precise knowledge of the Jewish reality in his glosses that he was either Jewish or else a first generation converso, but any conjectural efforts beyond what can be gauged with the translation itself and his glosses remain inconclusive. We stand on firmer ground as to the dating of his translation. Each of the three parts ends with a colophon that provides precise information on Toledo's progress. In the brief colophon to part one, Toledo offers a prayer of thanksgiving over the partial completion of an arduous task. In the lengthier colophon to part two, Toledo further specifies that this portion of the translation was concluded in Safra on a Friday, the 25th day of an unspecified month in 1419. It had to be August. Finally, the call of to part three explicitly states that this portion was completed in Seville, also on a Friday, February 8, 1432, and it gives us the name of the scribe, Alfonso Perez de Castings. I take off my hat, my hat to Alfonso. Despite some scholarly equivalence, 1432 stands at the very least as a definitive antepoint of for Toledo's completion of the entire Mostrador. In his reference to the translation, Toledo briefly summarizes for his patron's benefit the meaning of the guy's title and Maimonides' purpose in writing this composition as he understands them. And you have the Spanish text, uh, Hannah's 3B. He tells Suarez de Figueroa that the more stands for Mostrador, Enseñador de los Curvados, Guide and Teacher of the Deliver. You really have many English words for perplexed, don't you? Flummox, mystified, bewildered, befuddled, confused. English is so rich in that matter. And all the perplexed people. He also says that said turbados were Jews, I'm trying to translate from Spanish, Jews deeply learned in philosophy who harbor doubts in their hearts and great confusion over many things in the Holy Scriptures that seem to be against nation and reason. And he further states that the Randman's purpose in writing his guide was, in quote, and translate from Spanish, harmonize the holy scriptures of Moses and the prophets with the most exalted and excellent first philosophy, moral philosophy, and natural philosophy as it is to be found in said book. Toledo's unequivocal admiration for Maimonides' status as an rival philosophical genius goes hand in hand throughout the other colophons with his insistent plea for indulgence over his putative insufficiencies as translator. 
partly a rhetorical gesture of Carpaccio and Emolentia, and yet lays with a precise awareness of genuine impatience in painfully bringing to fruition this demanding translation. And you have the Spanish text, uh, three, uh, Handout 3C. Uh, what can be said about the translation itself? Toledo clearly translates from the Hebrew version, or versions, not from the Judeo Arabic original. Contrary to what she and Bazar saw, I have not found on increasable proof that he had direct access to any Arabic sources whatsoever in the original. But which of the Hebrew versions served as Toledo's immediate source? And how did he approach the translation process? Toledo expounds in the prologue on his sources and methods. The few glosses he wrote throughout the manuscript support most of his historical claims, as do a perfunctory examination of the translation itself. We are told, and most of my references are taken from the text on 3D in the Hanno, we are told in the prologue that there were different Hebrew translations of the guy. Toledo later intimated that there were at least four. I have no idea where he got the number four. Some of the experts here can come. But he claims to have worked only with Al Hadith and even beyond. Both translators, he argues, erred at times, made mistakes. Ambos trasladadores erraron in muchas cosas. A problem, he says, compounded in their textual transmission by the cumulative mistakes of Hebrew scribes who introduced errors of their own. Los escribanos otros ídolos por ser non letrados erraron viejos manifiestos. But Toledo acknowledges the consensus of his Jewish contemporaries that al Hadisis of the Tristic version was marked by more substantive errors in his understanding of philosophy than even the once called rendering of the Judeo Arabic original. <coughs> While praising the quality and beauty of al Hadisis Hebrew, Toledo deems his technical appreciation for the finer points of the guy's content more limited. Hadis es sabido ser bueno y cumplido en lenguaje es muy simple en la ciencia. Whereas even Kivon's superior command of Maimonidian philosophy is uncontested. Aventador mejor en la ciencia. Toledo's claim that both Hebrew translators heard may reflect some awareness of late medieval Hispano Jewish critiques, not only of al Hadis, but also of even Kivon. As in the 13th century, Moreja More, Shemdal Farakera's commentary on the guy, who, despite his supreme disdain for Al Hadis's More, insisted on the underscore some of Ibn Tibon's interpretive and philological shortcomings over against Al Hadisi. Moving now to his own pronunciamiento, and we have here the basis is text 3D in the handout. Toledo states that he would aim, as it is customary, según la costumbre, at a drastic translation at censum, at times adding or subtracting for the sake of clarity, obvia facet un vocablo dos y de dos vocablos uno, just like my monitor recommends to him on himself. Other times, uh, rendering the passage at literal, word by word, and mostly drawing from the best Hebrew version in accordance with the scholarly consensus. He claims, he claims that he will often pick and choose between the two versions, a portion from al Hadis here, another from Ibn Timon over there, and in the few cases where he simply fails to understand what a passage in the Hebrew text actually means, he promises to render it at literal. If we examine the translation more closely, Toledo's exordial claims bear out with one significant caveat. Notwithstanding his acknowledgement of even the non superior grasp of philosophy, Toledo does tend to privilege Al Hadisi over even Timon as the primary source of his translation. He does set, as promised, Al Hadisi and even Timon side by side, at times drawing from the latter, we will see this. But his text, more often than not, closely hews to Al Hadis's version. Toledo even follows Al Hadis's chapter divisions of the guide, combining into one chapters 26 and 27 in part one, and renumbering accordingly all subsequent chapters, the anonymous and cantorous losses 
even marks the point where chapter 27 should have begun. Indeed, through most of his postillae on part one, this hormonal critic highlights Toledo's to him problematic dependence on al along with Toledo's other perceived intellectual insufficiencies, set in a stark contrast with even Tibon's Hebrew version, whose superiority he defends on Maimonides' own authority. Toledo's rendering of the first sentence in Maimonides' epistle to Josephine and Agni swiftly establishes his initially greater dependence on al Haris's text. That's number four in the Hanel, and I have just the first sentence divided in nine little pieces with all sorts of comparanda. Just look briefly at eight and nine of that text. For example, porque mira el gran amor es para buscar la ciencia, visitar y fijar a la palabra, pines, because of your strong desire for inquiry, monk, a cause de tan de su amplitud, even the mon, the roster is deja al haderisha, al harisi, the rofa jaboteja, the vaquesha jaboteja, the latin, proper venes de fidelio y tu, en el cubriendo sapiencia. Toledos, tu amor, for Ramnas Kirsiha, reflects Al Harisis Ahaboteha, your love, the Siberian tomb, rather than even Tibon Serisuteha, your promise, diligence in rabbinic Hebrew, as noted as well by the Jewish Hormogen, who proposes at Morgon the Dihensia instead of Amor, Pasha Ibn Tibon. Or then again, number nine, también porque lindos cantigas en tu gran deseo al acatamiento de las sabidurías. And you can see all the comparando in the handouts. Toledos al acatamiento de las sabidurías is a lovely translation of al hadisis de yun hachokmot. Acatamiento is the nominal derivative of acatar, which says visually, to speculate is the etymological sense. Eh, whereas even Tibon opts to call my modest the memorial of reality for speculative matters with his Latvarin Haidunihim. The Colossus, on the other hand, corrects Toledo por que vi, Ashe y Mentibon, Ulenashe Baiti, as por cuanto de cuanto había visto. Al Hadisi remains Toledo's primary source throughout the entire translation as can be gauged by random florilegium of minor examples drawn from the other sections of the guide. I wanted to make sure that it was not an initial impression just from the first section, so I started picking up at random in sections one, two, and three. You have five examples in five, six, seven, and eight of the handout. Then you just look briefly at five and six. In number five, Toledo, says, porque en ellos se descubre la suciedad de su arte que plata de escorias agatada Juan en su poder. That's the text which Epines renders, and also because they would be led to recognize the falseness of the counterfeit money in their hands. In this striking line, Maimonides compares the falsehood upheld by Dutch philosophers, presumably the guy's first salvos against the Mutakadimum, with counterfeit money placed in their hands. Even Tibon's Hebrew rendering of Maimonides' analogy is faithful to the Judeo-Arabic original, whereas al Harisi, with a stylistic conceit typical of his belletristic writings as Ray illustrated, intertwines his expansive paraphrase at Sensu with a pertinent biblical intertext from Proverbs 26-23. The Hesef Sigim Metsuper is drawn from Proverbs. Now, al Hadith's recourse to this biblical proverb is inspired by the evocative association of a silver cross with my money that's counterfeit money. It is also reinforced by the concomitant contrast between Maimonides' exposure of that philosophers, Mikhail Ligade, and the concealment, Mesupe, of their errors. Toledo's translation aims at faithfully rendering Al Haris's paraphrase. Bahem, en ellos, si yu tramautan la sociedad de su arte, arte here with the meaning of wild, roots, like the artful culture in the Dickens, Hesef Sigim, Plata de Escorias, his only debatable choice is his rendering of the scriptural Metsulbe as atacada, perhaps atacada via metathesis, 
meaning a hash over later, Rashi and Rashi, which he translates more correctly in his gloss that model, when Toledo has his gloss and the Corbonian has his own, he translated as cubierta. Intriguingly, the anonymous glosses who rightly identifies the biblical quote from Michelet embarks on an intensely sarcastic expose of Toledo's literary wayfulness. It begins with a perceptive critique of his primary choice for translating Nesupe. However, his snarky gloss climaxes with the misguided claim that Toledo had no basis whatsoever for the insertion of the biblical quote. Now, it is not clear whether the critic actually missed Al Harris's biblical addendum as the basis for Toledo's or whether he was excluding Al Harisi in here from his acceptable canopy of translaciones verdaderas. But Toledo clearly did not come up with this intervention on his own. And briefly, number six, quiere decir según su manera y su gran grado fortaleza de su ser. Here, and you have the Hebrew Arabic and the Hebrew text and the Latin there, even Timon renders the Arabic had in Maimonides' explanation of Macron in a singular 312 as heavy in accordance with its basic meaning as portion, share, allotment. al Harisi, on the other hand, translated as Erech, value, estimation, honor, dignity. In his Moreja More, Falakera did al Harisi his view, erogenly, contesting even Tibon's rendering as erroneous on linguistic and philosophic grounds with the implicit suggestion that God had a share in reality when Maimonides clearly knew that all of reality was his. Toledo follows on Hadith with a more extensive paraphrase that renders Ere as grado, the opposite of Sem as both the adjective grand and the noun fortaleza, and Bamezuto as of his being rather than in existence, but as they avoids the cognitive connotation regulated by Falakera, whereas Toledo's su, his, reflects al Hadith's added pronominal inclinative, which is found neither in the judeo arabic al Judi nor in even Kibon's Baramitsiut, uh, but in Latin in Essentia Sua. Interestingly, the anonymous losses, who showcase it with such persistence Toledo's linguistic stings against even Stephen Hebrew version does not comment at all Toledo's deviation in situ, Pashi al Harisi. So, yes, Al Harisi's Baldetristic rendering provides the basic template for Toledo's all Spanish romanceamiento in limited, elegant prose. There are, however, several places from the Mostrador where Toledo, as promised, does compare the two Hebrew versions commenting on the contrast between them, and even revising his translation, Hashi ben Timon, in light of the latter's greater philosophical position. For example, and this example is number nine in the handout, in the I-236, Maimonides opened this well-known definition of prophecy, know that the true reality and good of prophecy consist in its being an overflow, overflowing from God, may he be cherished and honored through the intermediation of the active intellect toward the rational faculty in its first place and thereafter to the the faculty. Toledo's rendering, sabe que la profecía, la profecía en su cualidad es influencia, influida de Dios por medianería de la inteligencia obradera sobre el alma razonable primeramente que después la maquinativa. Toledo has a well-developed philosophical lexicon in all Spanish, not his Latin ex subquiditat for Maimonides Maquitaja, which both in and Timon al Harisi render as Neuta, or the old Spanish Inteligencia Obradera for the Adelphi Intellect. Toledo's basic source is also al Harisi, as reflected in his Sobre el Anima Razonable for the Hebrew al Kohane Kamedavere, rather than even Timon's al Kohane from the Judeo Arabic al Kohane and Kohayanati. However, Toledo eschews Al Harisi's periphrastic characterization of the language of overflowing, Hakabot and its Sal Nehabore, the glory emanated from the Creator, in favor of influencia influida de Dios, 
who shifts to pain and rendered the literary, the Hebrew polyptoton in even Timon Shefa Shefreyam and Hyrokin, finding the film in the Bible. In number 10, in the Guide 314, the, the handout, a slightly more complex example where Maimonides states the distance between the center of the earth and the lower part of the sphere of Saturn, Toledo translates la luminidad de entre el centro de la tierra y hasta lo alto de Saturno. Adding, in a marginal note, lo dis altura, dis aventabón suelo de Saturno, estudialo bien. Where it says high part, y Ventibón says Saturn's footstool, and you should study it well. Toledo's friend keeps the personality of the Toledo. His rendering of Maimonides Hadid, the lower part, as lo alto, the high part, is closer to even Timon's kibuf, the arch, kibuf shishatai, and for Hadid's hadon, which is footstool. A choice confirmed by his confusing note at Rockham, where Toledo mixes up even Timon with al Hadid's. Swallow the Saturno is clearly based on Hadid's hadon, not even Timon. Nonetheless, revealing his combative awareness of both alternatives and a clear choice therein in favor of even the one. Examples could be multiplied, but moving to his translation method, faithful at sensum renderings of his two Hebrew sources, alternate with both a slavish word by word cult and periphrastic elaborations of problematic segments where he claims to be spun by both versions for the guidance in his poems. Thankfully, Toledo, in his sparse glosses, explicitly underscores some of those nettles and places where he opted either to translate his Hebrew sources of literum or else to paraphrase and abridge Maimonides' discussion, thus corroborating his exordial claim that he would often indulge in both hyper-literal cause and simplification whenever he failed to understand a particular passage due, presumably, to intractable difficulties with either his Hebrew sources or, as is most often the case, the philosophical ideas conveyed therein. In number 11, you have a selection of the glosses that I just described, where he makes such claims. To discuss one briefly, which is number 12, in the Guide 151, my monitor sets out to argue from God's unity that there are no essential attributes in him by first reviewing a series of untenable claims to the contrary on the Mutakabi. Toledo drastically comprises in translation Rambo's diatribe against Kalam. The concluding paragraph, not only abridged but mostly rewritten by Toledo, also contains two marginal glosses that intimate his reasons for his periphrastic reduction. They are inserted in the text itself in Iconics. In this case, Toledo's problem was not the relative quality of the two Hebrew versions. Here, in one of the Hadithi, do not differ significantly, but the content itself, Maimonides' repudiation of the Kalan views with extreme formulations of their philosophical absurdity, which Toledo thinks, in a rhetorical fit of hyperbolic despair, refractory to translation. Que amas las relaciones en estos contados, que no me han ceso, ni razón romanzadas, y recibir lo que mejor puedo, que no puedo más. He still was as a lot on highlight similar reasons for his treatment of the Maimonidian source. A, his failure to understand the passage after consulting both Hebrew versions, and the presence of laughable notions in learned man would be untranslated. Now, Toledo's periphrastic moments often reveal as well a selective awareness of the limitations and sensibilities of his Christian readers. His Christian adversity is never far away from Toledo's mind. At times, for example, Toledo sidesteps a philological dispersa on technical points of biblical Hebrew grammar that would be both difficult to translate and mostly incomprehensible to his Christian adversary. Perfect example is rendering of the guy 167. At the end of the chapter, uh, Maimonides offers an extensive linguistic excursus on the Hebrew Bayanach in Exodus 20:11 to explain a way the anthropomorphic description of God as resting on the seventh day of creation. 
He first abuses the Russian interpretation of the intransitive verb Vayanach in Bereshit Tava as a transitive verb, meaning that creation ceased on that day. He then proposes an alternative explanation of Vayanach as an irregular conjugation of an altogether different Hebrew verb whose root is not nun but he, but either refers to it radical or referred to it radical. All this in order to reinterpret Exodus 20, 11, uh, as stating that after six days of cumulative invocations, God only uh, God only established on the seventh the whole of existence as is. This grammatical discussion is way finally to a sampling of biblical intertext with verbal derivations of Nunda He, also meaning to establish, and a comparable digression on the verb by like in Akash in Exodus 31 17. What does Toledo do? This is a handout number 13. He skips most of the biblical intertext at the end of the passage, drastically simplifies the grammatical explanation behind his philosophical exegesis of Exodus 20.11, and asks for good measures to be glosses on the margin on how most of these linguistic observations are either impossible to translate, linked to fallacious statements not worth all the effort, or else irrelevant to his main purpose and easily discarded. In another passage, the one in uh, Hannah 14, Toledo shows a slightly foolish side, perhaps in deference to the sensibilities of his Christian patron, in vulgarizing my modest discussion on the rabbinic prohibition against obscene language and the biblical euphemisms for lower bodily functions, expression, urination, copulation, at the end of the guide's decade. And you have his translation, which is very abridged, and he says at the end, en este capítulo hay cosas asquerosas, es escribir horrible things, e otras que no montan, que parecen burla y romance, they seem to be a joke. E por eso las sabe bien, a no fallece del capítulo rosa. Toledo expunges my monitor's long list of biblical examples, dispatched with a simple reference to las otras cosas viles de fábula, which is the textual basis of his exculpatory gloss. Despite such scruples and caveats, Toledo nonetheless does not relinquish his pedagogic mission in light of Suarez's original request. Most of his other glosses are linked to passages more or less faithfully rendered from Hebrew, simply to provide minimal explanatory notes on their philosophical content, Maimonides Greek and Arabic sources, the meaning of difficult Hebrew terms from his biblical and rabbinic intertext, a scattered reference to Jewish halachic practice and religious observance that may have puzzled his Christian reader, what are the tefillin, what are the tzitzit, what is shmini and seren, what are the four species woven into sukkah, and you have a long selection that I transcribe in number 15. I love the one where he said that the tzitzit is like the Christian scapulary worn by Carmelite monks. <laughs> I have some favorite. Um, at the times, Toledo in the cross may even share with his patron his own befollowment over conceptual difficulties, the technical philosophical issue discussed by Maimonides, something not reducible to the overlapping interpretive shortcomings of Alcharisia and Ventimon. And this is my second to last example that I just talked. I don't want to abuse your patience. And I'm sweating. I have five layers of clothes because I'm so good at that in Chicago winter, but inside here it doesn't make sense. <laughs> in the guy 152, Maimonides final taxonomy of affirmative attributes, the Corbin sage further subdivides the third group, affirmative attributes as qualities into four genera, closely following Aristotle's formal classification of qualities in the categories eight. The first of these four genera, which Aristotle describes as habit and disposition, exis, guides, and sentence, and Mika Waha in the Arabic translation of the Organo is explained by Maimonides in some detail. And you have Pines translation with some comparanda habit, and you have Toledo's translation and accompanying gloss. 
¿Cuántos podemos ver? Toledo here picks and chooses from both Al-Hadisi and Ibn Tibón. In his translation of this passage, his Temienda de Pecar, derived from Ibn Tibón and his Hadan Chet, rather than Al-Hadisi Samana, whereas his Maneras que hay en cuanto es animal, is a tad closer to Al-Hadisi than Ibn Tibón. However, both Hebrew translators from his side as noted with frustration by Toledo, in the respective formulations of the content issue that mystifies him, in amas trasladaciones me parece, en ondas regladas las maneras de este genus. And I have a problem in Maimonides Aristotelian source that Raman himself does not address, at least as far as Toledo can engage from the Hebrew versions, he cannot work with the Judeo Arab. In his intriguing gloss at Rotten, the Spanish translator rightly identifies Maimonides' source as Aristotle's categories, known in the Latin Middle Ages as the Predicamenta, Toledo's Predicamentos. Toledo also establishes correctly, with respect to the first of this genera, habits and dispositions, habituación and manera, in his gloss. Uh, the qualificatory distinction in Aristotle, which Maimonides skips, the distinction between habit as the more lasting condition, es fuerte de estar, such as acquire knowledge or a moral virtue, and, on the other hand, disposition, manera, as a condition that is easily changed, ligera de quitar, such as health. But how, Toledo now asks, could a habit and a disposition belong to the same genus? How could Aristotle justify lumping together something lasting and something easily changeable under the same genetic group? This is the cross of Toledo's perplexity which informs his loss, a genuine intellectual quandary over an Aristotelian assertion echoed in the guy which he finds inconsistent, and which he is more than happy to share with his Christian adversary. Much more remains to be ascertained about Toledo's intellectual profile as a Jewish scholar from his Spanish translation of the guide. For example, an issue that I would love to pursue in a future study, what is the exegetical and philological scope of Toledo's scriptural learning? One could examine comparatively Toledo's translation of Maimonides' scriptural quotes, both in light of the rabbinic and medieval commentaries, and in relationship with the other all Spanish romanciamientos of the Hebrew Bible aforementioned, to gauge with more precision Toledo's philological skill in biblical Hebrew and his exegetical formamentis, whether as an observant Jew or as a conversor. Now, my final example came out from verse 17, a passage from Toledo's translation of the guide 116, Maimonides exegetical excursus on Sul, the rock, as a biblical designation for God. Peña es nombre equivoco que es dicho por el monte, según dice, Eferirás en la Peña, en Exodus. Es nombre de piedra fuerte, como dice, Peña del Pedernal, fuertes espadas. Toledo's translation of the Greek segment from Exodus 17.6, eh, the Hikita Hatsur, coincides with all the extant Old Spanish renderings of the Hebrew original. They all say, like him, Eferiras en la Peña. On the other hand, the following line is capped with a scriptural tidbit, variously translated across the Old Spanish biblical corpus. And of what Suri in Joshua 5.2, we have in E3, these are all the, uh, you have the abbreviations for this manuscript in part of the Hannah. E3, Navajas de Piedra, E19, Navajas de Pedernales, E7 and E4, Navajas Agudas, and again, Navajas de Pedernales Agudas, the Oxford manuscript Navajas de Pedernal, Toledo, Fuertes Espadas, the Glosses, Espadas de Peña, and another historian, Cuchillos de Piedra. The primary meaning of the Hebrew uh, Havot, singular Hebeth, is sword, and Surin, stones. The anonymous critic of Toledo's Mostrador translated most literally as Espadas de Peña, a stone source. 
It's beautiful context. God's request to Joshua that he makes Harod's suiting to circumcise the to circumcise the Israelites a second time suggests that these Harod are actually knives, flint knives to be precise, as in your own Latin rendering cultos lapideos, echoed by Kiki and his six. Most of our medieval Jewish translations also reflect a similar contextual understanding. It's the shadow elucidation in both Rashi and David Kinky, Pasha Onkelos Aramaic translation as Usmerara Harifin, sharp circumcision knives. The Spanish Navajas, knives for Harbot, in seven, six of these Bibles, harks back to, the Peshari, to this Peshari explanation. But three of these Bibles translate at literal the Hebrew Surim, the Piedra, the Pedernales, the Pedernal. Two others, fully adhere to Onkelos with their Navajas Agudas, which is the same written as in the King James Sharp Knives. And Adagel combines both trends in his composite Navajas de Pedernal Agudas, Sharp Flintstone Knives. Where does Toledo fit within this spectrum? His Fuertes Espadas has no exact parallels, combining as it does a hyper-literal rhythm of Harbaugh as source only echoed by his critic with the type of Fuertes, which echoes in his wording in his special commentary on Harbaugh's Turin as Harbaugh has a king, a strong source. Kim explains as Turin is a metaphoric reference to their strength, further suggesting Pache Onkelos that they were made of metal and hosted copper bronze in La Azero French Asier steel in order to minimize the pain as much as possible of the sharp edges. So we have here Toledo takes a different route from the other translators by resorting to David in, in his commentary. To conclude, evidence is scarce but suggestive as to the concrete fate of Toledo's translation in late medieval and early modern Spain. There are two allusions to possible copies of the Spanish Mostrador in the 15th century library at the Count of Benavente and the early 16th century library of Fernando de Colón at the Biblioteca Colombina. In an earlier study, I tried to make a case for its possible impact on one of Santillana's philosophical poems, his Stoic dialogue, Villas contra Fortuna, based partly on both thematic concomitances with the guide and the plausible availability of Toledo's translation in Santillana's library. But whether or not this was the case, Toledo's mostrador is not merely a bibliographic avis clara in Iberian medieval studies. It can justly be hailed, along with De La Torre's Vision and Arrayel's Bible, as a rather impressive capstone to the cumulative array of all Spanish sources that first introduced Maimonides' religious philosophy to a receptive cohort of Christian readers on Toledo's side of the Pyrenees. The guide's intellectual legacy in these vernacular parts glowed with reduced softness on the Christian imaginer of late medieval Spain. Thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.